Um, good evening, I'm Kirsten Trant. I'm a program maker at Stream Generale, and welcome to this third event in the series, What is it like to be? In previous events, we talked about what it's like to be an octopus, or what is it like to be a plant. And if you missed those events, you can watch the recordings via our website. But tonight, we will talk about what is it like to be an insect with Lars Chitka. And Lars Chitka is a professor of sensory and behavioral uh, ecology at Queen Mary University of London. And he's well known for his work on the evolution of sensory systems and cognition using insect flower interactions as a model. And I think especially with bees, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And Lars sent us three questions related to what it's like to be an insect. And starting with, can insects imagine things? And do insects have emotions? And can insects appreciate the outcomes of their actions? I find it all very interesting question. <laughs> and for each question, he prepared a video of around 15 minutes, after which there is time for discussion and questions you would like to ask uh, Lars personally. And so in total, we have roughly about 30 minutes per question. So if you have a question for Lars, then please write it in the, in the chat. And it's in the right hand corner in the purple little arrow thing, you can uh, open it. Um, and I will pick questions from the chat and I will ask uh, the person who can ask their question to please unmute yourself and um, turn on your camera so you can ask your question personally to Lars. Please don't use the, haze, the raise hand function. Um, and also if you want to prevent getting all these notifications of people coming in and out of the session or the questions, uh, you can turn all these off under my settings, also by the purple little arrow thing. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, my colleague Kylie is also available. Um, so you can find her in the chat too, and you can ask her questions. Um, but now we'll hand over the floor to Lars. Lars, please. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much for your very kind invitation and the introduction. I'm, I'm kind of happy that I did send you video links because we seem to have some problems with electricity here. So hopefully I'll stay online during the entire presentation. But if I suddenly disappear, then it's uh, it's not that I'm being rude. It's, uh, it's <laughs> we won't take it personally. <laughs> so hopefully it will all work. So um, a few words about the videos. We had a lot of fun filming. We, we They will have, as you'll see, a, a special lockdown flair because we filmed the videos in, in my university's largest lecture theater with an audience of absolutely zero. And um, so it was, it was good fun, actually. We had to do several takes of the opening scene because I always started to laugh at the wrong moments. <laughs> so um, anyway, without further ado, I guess um, you've been given the, the, the video link, so we can start with um, the first one. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. So what I'd like to explore today is whether from what we know about B spatial cognition, we can make inferences about the question of whether bees or other insects are conscious. So what I mean by that is that there is some form of mental representation of things, of space, and of things in space. I also want to explore whether bees in the context of spatial cognition have an appreciation of the outcomes of their own actions and their spatial problem-solving tasks, and whether there might be emotional states that are linked to spatial settings. There are, in a bee's flight range, often dozens of different flower species, all differing in terms of nectar contents, in terms of pollen offerings, in terms of their spatial aggregation, their locations, the techniques that bees need to use to manipulate flowers and so on. So bees not only need to remember where their hive is, where these flowers are, but also which flowers are, um, have the best food offerings and how to get to these flowers and extract the food offerings. So bees need to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket in the same kind of way as human shop shoppers need to um, compare prices and quality of products and so on. Now it's been known early on 
but bees can remember multiple locations from which to forage at different times of day. Here's an experiment which is very informative by Carl von Frisch and his most successful student, Martin Lindauer. They trained the bees to forage from one particular foraging site south of the hive in the morning, one hour after sunrise, and another feeding station was rewarding in the evening, one hour before sunset. And the bees had to learn both of these locations and link them to the correct time. Okay, so when bees communicate about the, these two locations or others that they might have discovered, they use a symbolic communication system called the dance language. So what you observe in the darkness of the hive is that certain workers will display this repetitive figure eight shaped run that you see here in the middle. Now, the central straight path of the bee taken is the most informative bit. The longer that path is, or the longer um, the duration of this um, little walk in the middle, the further away is the food. There is also a code of direction in this language. The direction is coded as the direction of this central waggle run relative to gravity. If the bee dances straight up, as in this example, that tells other bees where in that the that the food source is directly in the direction of the sun straight up to other bees means fly to the sun so if on the other hand the dancing bee displays its waggle run downwards on the vertical honeycomb that tells other bees that the food source is opposite the sun so up means fly to the sun down Pointing, the waggle run pointing straight down means to other bees fly away from the sun, exactly 180 degrees from where the sun currently is. And finally, um, any kind of angle, of course, can be coded in this kind of way. So in this case, the waggle run is displayed from left to right, and that tells other bees fly 90 degrees to the right of the sun, wherever the sun currently is. Or you can, as in this image, 45 degrees to the right of the sun, you would, as you can see in the top left image, display a dance waggle run that's 45 degrees to the right of gravity. So the angle relative to gravity inside the hive means to other bees, once they've absorbed the information and decoded it, means to other bees that same angle relative to the sun when you're outside the hive. And so to remind you again of the original two feeding stations experiment, there was a morning feeding station available just after sunrise and an evening feeding station just um, before sunset. And bees learned to memorize both of these in a time-linked manner. Now here we can see a bee's dances over the course of the day. So on the x-axis we have the time of the day from zero through noon through midnight. And of course the sun's course um, changes over the, the time period. So the position, the angular position of the sun is in the azimuth um, curve that you can see diagonally across the screen. And we can see the bees dances. And during the um, morning hour, when this feeder was active, all the bees dances correctly indicated the right position, um, the, the southerly position relative to the sun's position. So that's all of these dances here, correct location indicated. And in the afternoon, all the um, dances pointed in the correct afternoon position, which was east of the hive. So far, so good. So that simply shows that the bees during the times that the feeder was active would actually indicate the correct positions. But remarkably, Martin Lindauer peered into the hive on some nights and observed that some bees will display these dances in the complete absence of a natural foraging situation. No bees fly out at night. They just stay inside the hive. So there's no natural need to communicate about food sources at all. And remarkably, those bees that displayed dances in the period from sunset to midnight, 
would approximately, albeit with some error, indicate correctly the afternoon location. So that's these dancers over here. Whereas those bees that indicated a food location dancing um, in the hours between midnight and sunrise would, albeit again with some variation, indicate the early morning site, the one that would only be rewarding again a few hours later. So these bees, in the complete absence of current stimulation from these food sources, they hadn't recently visited them, retrieved the correct coordinates in the correct time-affiliated manner, so that Early morning bees would indicate the later morning location, and late night bees would indicate the afternoon locations correctly. So there was a kind of access to a spatial memory outside the context of which, which it naturally occurs, which indicates to me at least that there is a kind of flexible access to these spatial memories that bees could just think about, so a form of offline thinking about spatial locations. So the technology that we're using nowadays to study bee orientation is called harmonic radar, which is a huge advantage over what von Frisch and Lindauer would have had at their disposition, because we can actually track bees over their entire flights and over their entire lives. So the technology works by um, one radar dish emitting a signal that is picked up by a bee's transponder. You can see this little antenna-shaped device glued on the bee's back. It looks huge, but it's actually very lightweight, so it doesn't disturb the bee. But what we can also do with this technology is follow bees over their entire lifetimes, from their maiden flight, the very first time they ever leave the hive, to their death, basically, and all the spatial movements in between can be fully monitored with this technology. So what we see here are two flights, one marked in green, the very first flight of that bee, which in this case lasted about two hours, and a very short um, second one, which is marked here in red. And this exploration flight, that very first flight of that bee, you can see takes it in loops, centered on the hive, which is marked in blue, in various directions. So there's one large loop in the easterly direction, there's another one in the northeasterly direction, and so on. So most of these loops actually are in different directions. She doesn't repeat her exploration. She returns to the vicinity of the hive several times and then flies out again and explores more. And in, in, in such exploration flights, bees learn both about their the landmarks surrounding their hives as well as about potential feeding locations. Now we're still following the same individual bee. This is one bee we're following here on its um, about 3 to 82, or days 2 um, to 6 of its life as an adult forager flower visiting bee. And the first thing the bee does on day 2 is make one more exploration loop in a South, um, east, southwesterly direction, seen here in green on the left. And then she's discovered something. She's discovered in the, the, the northwest a worthwhile flower patch, and then continues once she's discovered that resource, flying to it for dozens and dozens of times. She does nothing but back and forth, back and forth, between the hive and the, um, this particular foraging patch. Then the bee had to stay at home a few days because the weather was bad, and then what did she do after that? At first, she returned to the same location that she had visited the entire previous week. So you can see that's the green tracks here. She flies to that same forest edge for a few times. Then suddenly, on one outbound flight from the hive, seems to change her mind midway and flies over to a location further, more or less directly north from the hive, that she had only visited a single time several days earlier. In fact, 10 days earlier. So on day one, she'd been there once. And then she flies directly there and dedicates all the rest of her foraging life to that other patch that she's only seen um, during a single exploration flight. Now that's in a sense, anecdotal data, it's just a single bee that behaved in this way. But I think the 
observation that that bee appeared to change his mind, its mind, her mind, to um, fly to a location that she had visited way back, appears to me just like Lindauer's nocturnal dancing bees observations, that there is a kind of flexible access to spatial memory that can be retrieved um, when it's adapted, perhaps because the familiar foraging patch in this case was no longer as profitable as before. Okay, so our next question is, can bees picture things? Can they imagine things such as a flower's shape and so on? Now bees are of course famously good at recognizing flower patterns, but it's actually surprisingly difficult to find out whether there is such a thing as a mental representation of a flower, even if an insect recognizes it, because often it turns out it can be, that flower patterns can be recognized with simple feature detectors that analyze edge orientation and so on. So in our following experiment, we asked if bees can actually draw on a representation of a particular shape through multiple different sensory modalities, which would be more of an indication of a mental representation of shape than just recognizing a shape in the visual modality. So what we did initially is we trained the bees to distinguish two different shapes, balls and cubes, but in this case they could not touch them. They could only see them through a plexiglass lid and one of the shapes, in this case the ball, was associated with reward, that means a little reward of sugar, sugar solution, and the other, in this case the cubes, was not. And then the same bees that were trained in this manner were now presented with the same shapes in complete darkness, where they couldn't see at all, but in this case they were allowed to touch these different shapes. And in this case, when the bees had first been trained to see and be rewarded over balls that however they could not touch in the light, then if the same bees were tested in complete darkness, then they chose the balls over the cubes only using the touch modality. So, so they could recognize the same object in a different sensory modality. And we then also reversed this experiment where we first exposed the bees to the same shapes in complete darkness as shown in this photograph here. We used infrared light, of course, to monitor the bee's behavior. And you can see that the bee here is, is sort of hugging the ball while she's imbibing the sugar solution reward. The cube in this case was unrewarding. And then in the same manner, we switched the situation to one in which they could no longer rely on the touch modality, but on vision. However, again, in this particular experiment, the bees could not touch the shapes as they had during training, but only see them. And sure enough, the bee again, after being trained to a round shape in darkness, when she faced the same shapes in the light, picked the balls over the cubes. So in both of these scenarios, they picked the correct object in a different sensory modality from which we conclude from this kind of flexible axis through different sensory modality that indeed there must be a kind of mental representation of the shape of an object. But uh, so far we don't have a question, so that gives me the opportunity. Oh, there's one. Okay, I'm still going to ask my question though, because I love this little waggle dance, let's say. Um, but I was just wonder, wondering if there's a... Uh, um, if there's special explorer bees that know this dance, or do all these bees know this dance, or um, how does that work? So all bees can potentially dance, um, but there are some bees, so-called scout bees, that have a higher propensity to do so. And um, so these are bees that dedicate more time than others specifically to for alternative and potentially more rewarding food sources than those currently exploited. And these will then carry this information back to the hive and advertise it there. 
Um, and Orbeez, in principle, can also read the dance language. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, we also have a, um, a question by Rohan. Can you turn on your camera and video? You can ask the question. Yes, I don't know if I'm audible. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Ross. Thank you very much for it. Uh, it was a really interesting video. Now, my question might be jumping too much far ahead in, into the discussion, but from the information that you presented, it clearly seems that the beans have uh, a perception of their surroundings, but it's clearly reward based, so they're always searching for a reward. But in any way, do we can we extend that to the beings or insects having a person's perception of reality like humans do? Like we see a flower for the beauty of it, which doesn't have any physical reward, but has a mental reward. Okay, that's a very good question. Now, it is very difficult to know um, what any animals, including other humans, mental um, phenomena are in relation with things that are just perceived as beautiful by themselves. The dichotomy might not be as strong as you might think, so there are views of humans' appreciation of flowers' beauty is an evolutionary phenomenon where primordial humans perceived, for example, landscapes that were rich in diverse flowers as those that might be particularly habitable because it indicates fertility of the land, availability of water, and so on. Yeah. So there is, in that case, also a kind of um, a link with a, a reward, albeit perhaps a slightly more remote one. So I think we... we in bees, we, f we do find a little bit more than simply a link between, let's say, a flower um, visual appearance and a reward, because I think some of the work that I just showed you, both the historical work and our more extant work, appears to indicate that there is a kind of offline thinking, that bees can retrieve such memories, even if they're reward-based, um, from memory in conditions outside the current context of um, looking for food, for example, in these nocturnal dances. Whether they appreciate flowers in themselves as beautiful without having been exposed to a link between their appearance and a reward, we don't know. But certainly bees, even those that have never seen a flower before, will have certain innate preferences for certain kinds of colors and flowers, but we don't know whether that, that visual attraction or scent attraction is based on some sort of appreciation of beauty or simply a kind of innate search image for something that potentially indicates food. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I have just one follow-up on, one of the ex on the experiments that you showed with the bees. Uh, with multi-sensory modalities. So in the first situations, they were uh, held off from one sense, either touch or sight, and in the second one, they have been given the other one. So I'm assuming in this experimental setting, in the second uh, part of the experiment, there was no reward on either of the subjects. That's correct. In, in our tests, there is no reward for either option and of course all kinds of scent marks must be carefully removed so that the bees can't use some sort of simple trick to find the correct option okay perfect thank you all right all right we have uh, one other question by Dirk Jan. Dirk Jan, can you turn on your camera and microphone please Well, if it's difficult, we can, I can read the question yeah, I, back. I, so I think that, it, uh, it always takes a bit because the, they need permission and you need to give permission for your video. So I think he's coming. Okay. I see his little microphone All already right. on. Dear Ken, are All you right. there? Yes, I'm there and I'm trying to, <laughs> to get my video on. Yes. <laughs> it should be on. Hello. Hello. Yes. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Thank you very mm -hmm. much for a very kind uh, presentation.
for the first question. Um, is there a possibility that, there is, that bees recognize the smell of flowers and that they use that if in a certain lot smell gets less and in another lot the smells get better, that they change? Yes. Um, so smell just like color or visual patterns are memorized by bees in association with rewards. But again, there's very interesting work that they can also use scent information in an offline manner. So work from Mandiyam Srinivasan's team has indicated that if bees associate two different locations with a different scent each, that if he would then subsequently blow one of, of the two scents into the hive, the bees would correctly retrieve from memory the correct location and then fly to that location if it was presented in the hive, meaning in spatial and temporal removal from where it is normally presented. So they could retrieve the correct spatial memory from smelling the right scent. Is there something known about the smells they, the, the molecules they, the pheromones they, they, they smell? And then yes. You, um, then you can take so there, there are an air sample and see whether that, that fits with the change of location. Yes, so there is quite a bit known about um, these sense of smell and there are similarities as well as differences. So there are certain smells that bees can smell which we cannot smell at all. For example, CO2. Many insects can smell CO2 and I think that re highlights just how different um, senses, sensory systems extract information from the world around us. I have, if I try to imagine what CO2 might smell like, I draw a blank, but clearly certain, certain animals can do so. And yes, you can, if you wanted to do a neurobiological investigation, you can blow um, various scents over a bee's antenna. So the antenna is the, the insect's nose, so to speak, and then directly link um, the smells and their, their concentrations with um, neurobiological responses from the receptors in the antenna. Uh, uh, is the, the the spatial resolution between the antennas high enough to orient, or is it something like in bacteria that during they go, they they see or they trace less or more a gradient of the descent and thereby orient themselves on the new scent? It depends on the spatial scale. So if a bee is, for example, on a flower, they're very good at um, at, uh, at comparing the scent from the two different antenna and orienting their bodies accordingly, because often there are scent gradients inside flowers. But during free flight, when they cover a few meters per second, of course, the resolution isn't good enough to um, to orient in a in a gradient. So then there is a a side to side um, oscillation in many insects to to figure out the, the um, direction that a scent might be blowing. Right, we, have, uh, we have one more question before we uh, move on to the next question <laughs> from you, Lars. All right. Uh, Augusto, can you turn on your microphone and video, please? And ask your question. Let's see if he... Uh... No, I think he left. So there is uh, a, a question there's, about... There's one other one, yeah, from Martin. Do you see it? Martin, uh, can you turn on your um, camera? Yeah, there we go. Then you have the last question. <laughs> I'm in luck. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. So, yeah, I wonder, uh, do bees only communicate the um, positionality of food sources, like we saw in the video, or... or do these social bees also have the possibility of communicating other kinds of information that might be relevant, such as the, the, the smell or the, the, the color or the size uh, uh, or what type of food source, trees or flowers or... Uh -huh. 
Um, so the, the, the language is not as flexible as human language and that it can't um, convey arbitrary bits of information. It's not adaptable to new things that are novel in a bee's world, for example. But there are a few other bits of information. The scent, for example, is passed on to other bees, but simply because the foraging bee brings it back to the hive. She smells of the flowers that she's visited and also the nectar that she's brought is regurgitated during the dance and offered as samples to other bees so they can memorize the scent and they go out equipped with that information. But there's no information about color. There are also certain other signals. So for example, if bees have encountered um, a, a threat, a predator at a previously popular location, then bees um, coming back from that location will, will essentially headbutt other dancing bees indicating that location as a stop signal, basically saying, guys, don't go there anymore. So there, there are certain other bits of information that can also be passed on, but not others, and not arbitrary contents as in human language. All right. That's okay. fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, shall we? Are you ready, uh, Lars, for the next question? Shall we watch the yeah. video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So every video starts with a sort of historic example, and then we're switching over to uh, more more recent work. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, All right. Post the next video. You can find it in the in the chat again. Do insects have emotions? Charles Turner did at least take this possibility. Seriously, I invite you all to read the papers of this man. He lived from 1867 to 1923. He was a, an entomologist as well as a psychologist, and his literature is extremely rich with visionary ideas that unfortunately have been largely forgotten today. But it's remarkable also that he actually did consider the possibility of these digger wasps having emotions. So this is a photograph by him from one of his papers in 1912. And he writes this, the coiled antenna, the protruding mouth parts, and the general attitude indicate intense excitement. One who believes that insects have emotions will find much in the attitude of these true Ammophilus to support his view. Now Turner was aware that this was merely an observation. It was not an experimental exploration. He has very rigorous experiments in many of his other papers, which I would strongly encourage you to read. Now, the alternative view that insects do not have any kind of emotions or are capable of suffering is epitomized in this website here, which um, advertises the commercial availability of live insects for electrophysiological experiments for laymen. So this website, Backyard Brains, cheerfully announces that we are excited to announce the world's first commercially available cyborg. With our Roboroach, you can briefly wirelessly control the left-right right movements of a cockroach by microstimulation of the antennal nerves. In a biologically relevant example, the traditional view of insects as reflex automatons or Philosophical, philosophical zombies is encapsulated in this image here, where the traditional view holds that even though you can see the, the, the bee in, that's freshly been caught in a spider web struggling and trying to get away, is that this is merely a hardwired program to, designed to facilitate escape, but that the bee actually feels nothing or foresees um, not the, the kind of uh, potentially disastrous scenario that is about to materialize. And to explore this a little further, um, I'll show you a little video from a French television channel about our explorations of the possibility of emotions in insects. It was even thought that animals like bees, other insects, do not even have basic nociception that is a, a more reflex-like response to um, a potentially an injuring or a potentially injuring stimulus. So there are classic reports uh, or, or quotations, for example, by a Nobel laureate, Carl von Frisch, who claimed that when 
a bee is happily sucking nectar, you can take a pair of scissors and cut off her abdomen and she won't even respond to that stimulus. So the claim there was that not even that they don't have pain, but they don't even have a reflex-like response to a damaging stimulus. That, of course, is nonsense. So anyone who's ever witnessed, say, an insect, a grasshopper, um, or indeed an, a, a, an earthworm being impaled on a fishing hook will know that they resist that sort of treatment with the same kind of vigor that a human being might when they're impaled on a, on a hook. So clearly there is basic nociception. That you can measure um, the extent to which an animal tries to get away from a potentially harmful stimulus. It's interesting to know that the stimulus for, or one stimulus for bees to engage in such attacks is alarm pheromone. So if their hive is attacked, some of the bees will register that and spread a scent in the air um, that tells other bees there is a threat, um, we're, we're under attack, um, and which provokes other bees to counterattack and to find the, the potential threat. So what people have found um, is that uh, if bees are exposed to this alarm pheromone, they're actually less likely to deliver, to have a pain-like response. So they seem to be flooding their system with an endogenous painkiller as a result of smelling the alarm pheromone, which of course is indicative that there is some sort of awareness of a threat of injury, but that this um, awareness and the potential um, fear associated with it is ameliorated by an endogenous substance um, that functions as a painkiller. Lars Chitka is specialized in bumblebee behavior. His team is trying to understand the cognitive capacities of this insect. Okay, welcome to the bee lab. You can see some young scientists in action, as well as some bees learning things. The nest naturally would be in a cavity in an abundant mouse hole, for example, um, where a single queen starts a nest in spring and then starts to lay eggs and um, raise their young. And once she has some workers of her own, they will take on the foraging activities. And the, the tunnel is the equivalent of the mouse hole tunnel in the natural world. And these boxes are what we call our flight arenas. That's where we present them with various types of artificial flowers and puzzle boxes which the bees then have to learn about. Here, the bees learn to count, manipulate simple objects, and solve puzzles. It turns out they are incredibly intelligent. Not only are they capable of finding solutions, but also transmitting them to their peers so they can learn too. During one of their scientific studies, the team made an astonishing finding. So we began um, becoming interested in the subject in a study where we exposed bees to simulated spider attacks. So the prediction for a reflex-like robotic um, insect pollinator would be, okay, if they get attacked by a spider, then of course they register that attack and try to get away, but that ends there. But what we found instead was an indication that the bees whole behavior changed after such a crab spider attack in that they don't didn't just fly away from the flower but they would then subsequently um, fly more slowly and inspect every flower very carefully before landing on the flowers and this behavior change lasted for more than 24 hours after an attack so there was a long lasting behavior change but moreover they didn't just inspect the flowers for longer but they also behaved as if they were seeing ghosts. So often they inspected the flower, and even if there was no crab spider hidden on it, they'd fly away again, as if they thought, oh, uh, this doesn't look quite safe. And that was already an indication of there being long-lasting behavior changes as a result of a scary experience which is more equivalent to an emotion-like state in vertebrates or humans um, than the predictions that would arise from just a reflex-like robotic um, behavior. There's no way to judge emotions objectively, even in other humans. So all we can do is measure a variety of observable behavioral responses, 
that would be indicative of emotional states in us, but the, the, the judgment is always an indirect one. But the more evidence we can accumulate from both psychology and behavior, as well as physiology, neural stages, hormonal stages, um, then of course the more comprehensive a picture we get on the potential emotion-like states. But how might one test emotions in insects experimentally and quantitatively? Well, we chose to use a paradigm that is simply borrowed from vertebrate research. It is basically asking whether an animal's or an individual's glass is half full or half empty, as symbolized in this little um, photograph here. So an optimist would judge this ambiguous situation as being glass half full, and the pessimist faced with exactly the same situation would say it is half empty. And so you can actually test um, animals' emotional states by asking them the same kind of question in ambiguous situations. And that sort of task that I'm just going to explain is used exactly in the same kind of manner in domestic animals, for example, to find out whether um, they're happy domestic animals or unhappy ones. So what did we do? We have a little flight arena, as you can see there on top, and the bee has five options, either to pick the leftmost options, option marked in purple, or the right marked in green. And there's only ever one option available, so it's a so-called go, no-go task. And what the um, animal learns over time is that whenever the blue left option is available, there is a reward. Whenever the green right option is available, there is no reward. And after this training, the bee is then faced with various intermediate ambiguous options, such as turquoise or greenish turquoise or bluish turquoise. And we're then asking, well, do you judge this more likely as being a positive outcome? Might the glass be half full or a negative one? Is it unrewarding in this case? So here's the training in simple forms, what the bee does when uh, she's learned that, that um, the, the blue left option is rewarding. She flies there in a straight line. If, on the other hand, the green option is presented, the bee already knows, well, this isn't any good. She faffs about for a great um, deal of time and then finally says, well, okay, I might as well go and try it. But she takes a much longer delay time before accepting an option that she already knows as being unrewarding. The question then is, what happens with the ambiguous intermediate option? So here is a turquoise one. And again, when we um, present the bee with the turquoise option, we then measure the delay time that it takes her to accept that option. And interestingly, that delay time depends on something that happened before this experiment. It depends on whether we gave the bee a little sucrose um, droplet as a surprise. So here she gets five microliters of a surprise droplet of sucrose in the run-up to the experiment before she even enters the arena. And in the control group, she um, gets nothing. And it turns out that the way the bee judges this ambiguous situation, turquoise, depends on what happened before she even started the experiment. And that's shown in this graph on the right side here. So when the bees face their familiar rewarding option, that's P on the right, the delay time is invariably very short. They fly straight there. If, on the other hand, the, um, the green right option is shown, that's shown on the right here, invariably the bees will delay for quite some time before accepting that option. But for all the ambiguous options, so turquoise being in the middle, there is a difference depending on what happened before the experiment. So if the bees before starting the experiment had their little surprise reward, ooh, there's a sweet that I've never seen here before, they tend to accept the ambiguous option faster, that's our red line here, than they would otherwise. So if there was a surprise reward before the experiment, the bees accept the intermediate option more rapidly. So they behave in this glass half full, glass half empty, in this ambiguous situation more optimistically 
if they've had a surprise reward before entering the experiment. And you can do, of course, the same with adverse stimuli, in which case the bee will behave in the opposite way. So there is, by the same criteria by which we judge mammals, domestic animals, as being emotionally biased in either a positive or a negative direction, by the same criteria, bees could be judged to have simple emotional states. Finally, some broader conclusions, that there are sorts of emotional states, at least by the same criteria as we diagnose them in large brain mammals, that there are emotional states that, um, that we can diagnose and that we should perhaps explore whether there are even emotions that we don't know in other animals, such as that might be linked to unique bee minds, unique bee problems, such as the discovery of a nectar-rich flower or the swarming process when honeybees move from one hive to the next. And finally, I think it's important to consider the ethical implications of such research, um, the possibility that there is a mind, possibly suffering in bees, and I think that is important for how we consider their conservation, as well as thinking about how we treat animals in research laboratories. All right. So people, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and uh, we can go from there. For now, there are no questions yet, so I can ask the question again. Um, because okay. I'm, I mean, first of all, I like the idea that a bee can have a good day or a bad day, <laughs> in an emotional state. <laughs> I'm not having my day. But um, I'm actually especially triggered by the by the, what you said on the last uh, thing, that unique emotions that maybe are special for bees. Can you talk a bit more about that? What, is, uh, what, what kind of emo, like, uh, I don't know, have you had examples or did you already have an idea of maybe doing research on that? Or? Well, I mean, it's, it's a difficult topic, um, but I guess what I have in mind here is that with a lot of animal psychology or comparative cognition where we where we look at um, animals' intelligence in laboratory settings, there is a very anthropocentric approach in that we, we explore in animals whether they display something that is in some ways similar or familiar to us, and that often in people's understanding of animal psychology, there is this approach that they're actually only interesting to the extent that they're a bit human-like. And I think this overlooks the fact that there are many situations in an animal's life that actually have no parallel in, in the human world. And, and while that also means that it will be more difficult to explore, I think it's a, it's a valuable direction to, to look into. So examples that I have in mind is, so I mentioned briefly the swarming process. So what happens in, in bees as opposed to most other animals is that not the young new individuals leave the familiar home, but the old queen leaves with perhaps 10, 20,000 um, seasoned forager bees. And they then settle on a nearby um, tree and um, from there scouts fan over um, a large territory in all directions, bring back information about new pos possible hive locations and, um, and uh, in the end, the, uh, the, the whole swarm decides on a single location and they, they settle in that new location. And the, the psychology of that or the, the, the um, process by which that happens is, is, is one thing, but there are possible, so people have um, observed for a long time that the, the behavior of the bees in the swarm is changed compared to um, bees' normal behavior when they're in the hive. So, for example, all aggression is completely switched off. There seems to be a kind of um, exuberance or excitement in the bees while they're leaving the hive and then forming this swarm cluster and so on. So that's a process that's wholly unlike anything we know in other animals or humans for that matter. And it would be fascinating to explore perhaps um, 
looking at hormonal changes or psychological measures such as quantifying um, aggression or responses to certain stimuli um, to see if this is a kind of unique state that actually is absent in many other animals. There are other things that are um, unique in a, in a bee's biology. So for example, in, a, in honeybees, there is the phenomenon that they sacrifice their own lives when um, when they are when they attack, let's say, a, a bear who um, who uh, dis dismantles their hive to get to the honey. So they sting, but they lose their, their whole stinging apparatus rips out, um, and so that the bee who stings a vertebrate with elastic skin will perish. And there's already evidence that there might be a kind of endogenous or an equivalent of an endogenous opiate system that floods the bee system before such an attack, perhaps to immunize them against uh, the subjective experience of pain. But we don't, this is, this is only um, the early beginnings of work in that direction. But again, it's a unique kind of situation that could be studied in a valuable manner in an insect without this strange assumption that it's, it's, it has to be something human-like that we need to explore for it to be interesting or indeed explorable yeah no it's true and but i think it's also you know harder to imagine if it's not human-like so that's why you know like because how do you even start to yeah so what it's like to be a bee of course that to start to imagine things that we don't even have in our own uh, you know in our own sort of doing and yes. in the meantime we have another question by uh, hugo hugo can you turn on your microphone and video please Um, yes, can you hear me and see me? We can hear you. We can hear yep. you. Not see you, we can hear you. That's good. <laughs> should, I don't know why That's you fine. It's fine. See me. Ah, there you okay. Go. All right. Oh, okay, thanks. Well, uh, a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I don't know, know anything about bees, but this idea uh, of uh, bees' unique emotion is really fascinating for me from the neuroscientific point of view. So I was wondering, uh, how does the, the development of these unique uh, bees emotions may be? That's my first question. And the second one is related to the possibility that maybe, I don't know, but maybe across hives, there are, let's say, uh, differences uh, on culture. So may these bees emotions also vary or relate to those differences across hives? So the, 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 the first half of your question, I can only speculate. Um, so we don't, um, while I think it's a valuable direction of research to explore the neurobiological or hormonal or behavioral basis of unique bee emotions, we haven't done that yet. Um, so we've begun exploring the topic of bee emotions with simple emotions such as these pessimistic or optimistic states, but we haven't ventured further yet. Now, on the other hand, yes, there are both genetic and learned differences between different colonies. So in the subsequent um, talk, for example, I briefly mentioned an example where we taught bees to pull strings for reward and such a such a, a learned information can spread very rapidly through an entire colony in which case it's it's so to speak it's that that colony's private knowledge that other colonies beehives won't have access to and in the same way in nature um, bees could for example um, monopolize certain flower resources that are um, distinguished by their scent from other ones so that one hive might have a, a different specialization to another one that's actually set in the same or largely the same location. Okay, it's, it's really fascinating and it's food for thought, I, I think. And uh, thanks for your, your answers. No, oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, we also have, a, uh, I think Augusto has another question, but his internet's not doing very well. So let's go first to Victor and see if Augusto is back. Victor, can you um, turn on your microphone? Yes, hello. 
Yep, we Hello? can see and hear you. Yeah. Uh, and maybe Lars turn off, uh, turn off the microphone while he asks the question because I think there's some interference with the sound. So we turn off the microphones. I turn on. It's okay. Okay. Um, I I am studying uh, flower flies, uh, diptera, and uh, they are some some of them are similar to bees, and they have some behavior that is also interesting. And I wonder to know if uh, when they are when when bees are trying to solve some uh, problem, uh, my question is they learn to solve or to use some tools individual, but when are when they are going to solve the problem, then can cooperate with other ones, uh, but. The, the question is, they learn individual, but they can also communicate to another one to teach uh, how to solve and then cooperate to to solve. Or the question is, they learn individual and they can communicate to each to other or, you know? Yes, all of this is correct. So, um... Bees will learn in nature as well as in our laboratory individually which um, flower colors or scents or patterns are associated with rewards. In the case of the honeybees, they can also communicate to other bees the locations of such flowers and pass on the scent in, um, in the hive and during the dances. And um, they can learn to solve certain tasks like puzzle boxes or string pulling by observing how other bees solve these tasks. In terms of cooperation, one of my um, former postdocs, Oli Lukola, um, has, has devised a task where multiple bees together have to, um, have to move a block in order to gain access to a reward. So they have to cooperate and it appears that they actually learn to cooperate as well, but that's as yet unpublished. Okay, very interesting, thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, we go to the last question of Victor before we then move on to your last question, <laughs> Lars. Um, am I in? Yeah, I hear you, I hear you. I'm in. Um, I wonder what the effect is of the different developmental programs for the or organisms because uh, vertebrates uh, develop by uh, a neural tube. And that means that the nervous system, the central nervous system uh, is developing, uh, in fact, uh, separated from the peripheral nervous system. So there are, two, there are clearly two different systems. And I don't think that the insect has that. So it means that uh, the development of our brain is uh, quite different from that of the insect. What might that? Uh, what might the con consequence uh, be of that the difference in development on the functioning of the brain and on processes like cognition and consciousness? That's a good question and one that could potentially require a very long answer. So there are, of course, many differences as well as similarities between invertebrates and vertebrates nervous system. So many of the essential building blocks of the nervous system, such as transmitters, um, receptor molecules, um, um, channel molecules, and so on, that are shared between vertebrates and invertebrates. But their, their nervous systems in many ways are, are, of course, also different. So insects don't have myelinization. Um, in some insects, such as fruit flies, for example, um, methylation um, epigenetics seems to play very little of a role, whereas in other insects like vertebrates, um, methylation does play an important role in, in neural development. So there are many differences as well as similarities. Um, but I think more importantly for phenomena such as learning and memory, there are actually a lot of similarities in that learning and memory is um, in both clades mediated by changes in synaptic strengths and so on. And convergently, many of the, 
or similar organizational principles of wiring up a nervous system also occur in both vertebrates as well as invertebrates. Well, my question uh, is, is especially aimed at the fact that the, that the neural tube uh, makes a very a strong distinction between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. And that means that the communication between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system is more indirect. So the, the brain, the central nervous system in vertebrates is completely um, away distinct from the peripheral nervous system, so from the, the out the out out my world. Does that not have effect on the process of cognition and consciousness? I don't know if there's been any exploration of whether it has an effect of of con either consciousness or cognition. I guess neural tube defects in um, in vertebrates, of course, do have very profound effects, at least in some cases, about later uh, cognitive function or nervous system function. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure one can say that they are wholly separate in either clay. So. Of course, there is some continuity in that both the brain and the um, the um, spinal cord are derived from the the neural tube. So there is a connection there. There is decentralization in both vertebrates as well as invertebrates, and in that there are peripheral ganglia that do at least some of the information processing um, outside the brain in the peripheral nervous system, and so on. So even if there are many um, developmental differences, obviously we have a our new neural um, our, our um, cord uh, in a dorsal location, whereas insects have it in a ventral location, and so on. I think by convergence, many of the the uh, central processes of information processing are actually, um, in terms of the circuits, quite similar. But these are differences not in gross neural anatomy, but in terms of microcircuits in either cortical columns or certain columnar organizations that we also find, say, in the central body of the, the insect brain. Maybe as All a right. third and last uh, we should, Sorry, Victor, but I think we should move on to the to the next uh, video, because the time is uh, ticking. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. If there are fewer questions for the next video, then we can come back to this one, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> All right, the link is in the chat. I again. also want to explore whether bees, in the context of spatial cognition, have an ap appreciation of the outcomes of their own actions and their spatial problem solving tasks. So, there is a common perception that while people realize that insects can do very complex things, that they do them by means wholly different from how humans solve them. So here is something that at first glance maybe shows a similar outcome. The um, famous La Sagrada Familia Cathedral in Barcelona and a large termite construction roughly of a similar shape. And the common perception is that in the human architecture case there is a master plan, a plan for how the ultimate outcome should look, and then all the other actions are subordinate to that plan. Whereas in insects, everything arises by local interactions um, where no one has any idea of what the ultimate product should look like. And I will hopefully show you some examples that at least this um, dichotomy between these two different paths isn't quite so clear cut as you might think. The discussion is quite old, it's not novel. Um, so here's Charles Bonnet, a Swiss naturalist who lived from 1720 to 1793. And Charles Bonnet had the following to say about self-organization in the bee colony and the, the possibility of how one might construct something as marvelous as the um, hexagonal structure of a honeycomb shown here on the bottom left. He said this, place together in the same room 10,000 automatons animated with a living force and all induced through the perfect resemblance of their outer and inner being. 
If we admit the least degree of feeling in these automatons, even only such as is necessary for them to be conscious of their own existence, seek their own conservation, avoid noxious things, prepare useful things, etc., their work will not only be regular, well-proportioned, similar, equal, but it will also have symmetry, strength, convenience to the highest point of perfection. So it's interesting here that Bonnet sees the idea of there being a consciousness and feelings sort of as something primitive, as something given, but he still calls them automatons and thinks that somehow by just putting all of these conscious automatons together in the same room, something as magnificent as this honeycomb structure might arise just naturally. Now, I do not think that it's quite so simple. Of course, there have been quite a few crude human experiments in stuffing 10,000 animals together in the same room, as you can see in this chicken battery farm. And for some reason, something as regularly structured as a honeycomb or any form of architecture clearly does not emerge just by itself. So you need a little more than just uh, stuffing lots of animals, perhaps conscious animals, together in the same room to arrive at any form of animal architecture. So many people have mused that there is something remarkable about this extremely regular construction of a honeycomb. You can see a honeycomb under construction. Here there are dozens or hundreds of individuals of bees participating in this process. It's a mathematically perfect solution for honey storage, for brood storage, um, in terms of minimizing materials and space used and so on. It's also double-sided, so on both sides you can store larvae and, and honey and so on. And typically the structure is started at the ceiling of the, the hive and then gradually the bees work their way down until they've reached the bottom. But another Swiss naturalist, François Hubert, um, explored the inner workings of the hive centuries ago and made some very surprising discoveries. So he experimented with glass hives to see what the bees might do inside the hive while they're constructing their beautifully regular honeycombs. And what he found was the first thing that if he introduced a glass ceiling into the hive is that the bees didn't particularly like attaching wax comb to glass. So surprisingly, that didn't perturb them much because they simply then inverted the entire construction process 180 degrees. Instead of working their way downward from the ceiling, they built the whole comb as a tower construction, starting at the bottom and then gradually working their way up until they'd reached the ceiling. Now, it's still a very repetitive process, but if you'd programmed a robot to do exactly the same as the honeybee does, working down along gravity, that robot would already fail at this particular challenge unless you told the robot to be able to invert their procedure in its alignment with gravity. But the next experiment was even more surprising. So Hubert, when he discovered this flexibility in bees, then introduced a glass bottom in addition to a glass ceiling. And what he found in that case is that the bees would start on the side wall of the, the hive and extend the comb construction laterally through the cavity that he had provided the bees with. What Hubert did next was the really surprising result. While the construction was in process, so the bees had been ha had built halfway through the cavity, he then put a glass obstacle in the projected path of the growing honeycomb. Okay, so the bees had already built their two-dimensional construction almost or uh, halfway through that cavity, and then suddenly there was an obstacle that the bees would have perceived perhaps if they explored further in the linear direction of the growing honeycomb, found that it must have been suboptimal because what happened was that the bees then, before actually reaching the suboptimal surface, would build a 90 degree kink into the comb and attach it to the nearest sidewall. 
So they avoided projecting from the geometry of the current um, construction that there might be uh, a suboptimal outcome several days down the line. It takes a long while to build honeycomb. They projected and anticipated, or seemed to have anticipated this suboptimal outcome and took uh, corrective action before it materialized and um, built this uh, strange curve construction. And Hubert, 200 years ago, um, said, I acknowledge that I could not suppress a sentiment of admiration for an action in which the brightest foresight was displayed. So these um, experiments await replication with um, modern acceptable sample sizes, but they're nonetheless very interesting in part because they were not actually designed to explore foresight. And it was a surprise discovery, and that is, I think, very informative. So Hubert thought that bees have a kind of master plan, a, an idea of what the desirable outcome of their coom construction might be like. When I talked to colleagues who work on cognition in primates and corvid birds, they were always a bit dismissive of bees' learning abilities. I told them about how bees can learn colors of flowers and scents and so on. And they said, well, that's what bees do every day in visiting flowers. It's not any evidence for intelligence. And so they were at the time working in, on things like string pulling tasks in corvid birds, for example. And at some point, just to be provocative in a lab meeting, I said, well, I bet our bees can solve such a string pulling puzzle and no one quite believed it. But I had a few um, bold postdocs in my lab who were willing to give it a go. And so what you can see in this slide is a task, uh, is a string pulling task in which there are three artificial flowers, each uh, connected to a string and with a central nectar well that a bee would have to get to in order to obtain a reward. And what you can see in this video is the first bee that we ever trained to solve such a task. Here she is landing, and now she's found the string and she's pulling it out. She's not landing on the top of the flower. She clearly is, is not necessarily efficient at it, but she knows what she's doing in that she has to pull that string and, um, and remove it from under the glass table to get an access to a reward. For the next experiment, the task is to move the ball, in this case from the periphery, to the center of this horizontal area. And once the ball arrives in the center, the bee gets a sugar reward. So they can be trained to do that just fine. But the reason why the social learning by observation in this task is so particularly remarkable is this. So what we can see in this slide um, is a task with two bumblebees. Here is an experienced bee that has already solved the task before. That's our so-called demonstrator. And then there's an observer which has never solved that task before, so she's entirely naive. And when the two bees get together, this is what happens if you um, so you can see here the experienced bee rolling the ball to the center, and then they both get a little sugar droplet as a reward. Now, obviously, the logical way to solve this task, if all you need to do is to get a ball into the center, would be to pick the closest ball um, that's closest to the target area and move that to um, the center. But we've played a little trick. The experienced bee, the one that you've just seen roll the ball into the center, actually knows that the two closest balls, this one and that one, cannot be moved because they're glued down. So that bee knows I have to pick the furthest ball, so the least optimal one, to move to the target area. And so for three times, the naive observer gets to see that. It gets to see the, the demonstrator bee use the furthest ball moving it into the central target area. So what we see in this slide now is the observer being alone. This observer has seen the demonstrator solve the task three times, and every time the demonstrator used the furthest ball. Now the observer is on her own. Will she pick the same furthest ball, or will she solve the task in a better way and pick the closest ball? and she picks the closest ball. 
So she's not simply copying the demonstrator exactly. She actually seems to have a form of understanding of what is the desired outcome of her actions. And rather than simply aping the demonstrator, she picks the optimal ball to solve the task. So finally, some conclusions. We have seen from our experimental work and that of others that bees appear to have some sort of representations of space and time that they can learn by observation, that indeed they can use, display a simple form of tool use in a manner that indicates an intentionality or a form of understanding the outcome of their actions. It appears from our work, bees have access to a kind of memory library and an idea of what they want and how to get there and to explore in their minds possible solutions to the desirable, the desirable outcomes. Now, some of you might counter or a philosopher might counter that none of this is actually formal evidence for consciousness and they would be right. All of these abilities one by one could be replicated in software or in hardware implementations, a robot. But I think in their sum, all of these um, abilities nudge the probabilities increasingly in the direction of a conscious agent. There is a crucial difference in that while you could build a robot that can deliver all of these different performances, if you had built one 10 years ago mimicking everything a bee was known to display, then perhaps color learning and scent learning and place learning, that robot would fall flat on its face with novel tasks such as string pulling and ball rolling and learning by observation and so on. So you can build a robot to do something that you ask it to do. Good, you're a good programmer. But not easily to solve problems that it's never been encountered encountering before. And that is what bees seem to be doing over and over again. And I assume that in the coming years, we'll find yet more cognitive performances that bees can do but a robot programmed to do what we've known bees to do in the past will fail with these novel challenges. Um, what I was wondering, uh, because you mentioned that we might find other cognitive performances, you know, that, that they can do what a robot cannot do in the, in the coming years, let's say. And I was just wondering if you already have something in mind or you're onto something already that, uh, is, in, that is different that bees can do that, you know, robots can never do in their problem solving. Skills, well, I don't think there's anything a robot can never do, um, but I think the, the crucial difference is that you need to tell your robot what you want it to do. Exactly, yeah. It had you built, let's say, a robotic bee 10 years ago, that, that was that in which you implemented everything a bee was known to do until that time. That would probably be challenging, but it would be possible. But that robot would then fail with any kind of novel challenge that until that time was not known. So I mean, we do various things in, in the lab um, right now that I suspect again, so the, one example from my PhD student Alice Bridges is that she builds puzzle boxes that require a multiple step. Um, so there are multiple steps of actions that the bees need to take to open these boxes to get access to a reward. It's not just a single step, but it's um, more than one step. Um, and again, I think um, this would be a trivial challenge for a robot if you built a robot with the instruction of how to do it. But if you had just built a robot that was able to, let's say, string pull or ball roll to a target, it would again um, fail at this, this kind of novel challenge. And that I think is the difference. All right. That there, there clearly is a kind of flexibility in, in the B to solve yet more and more tasks that until rel relatively recently, we, we would have thought to be the, the, the domain of much larger brain insects. And that's not just work from, from our team, but also from Martin Jorfa and colleagues and so on. Um, but but that, uh, that 
if you wanted to implement them into any kind of robotic device, you'd have to do so. You, you couldn't build that flexibility into a robot so easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And this, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's move on to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you turn on your camera and, and uh, video, please? Yes, I think you're there. <laughs> yes. Hi, good night. Thank you for Hello. the presentation. Really nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I have one question, and uh, this is about the the consciousness of, of the bees, and um, if maybe there is any evidence of where some chemicals like pesticides maybe can regulate the behavior or the social behavior or the making decision in the bees. By the chemicals I saw in your chat that you meant things like pesticides. But exactly, yes. When, for yeah. example, the exposition to this type of chemicals can affect the, the social behavior. Um, yes, so a lot is, there's a lot of work on the effects of neonicotinoid pesticides on bee behavior because, so these substances are used in agriculture to prevent or um, to to um, protect plants from herbivorous insects and unfortunately these substances also leak into the nectar of the flowers and are, are thus picked up by bees there um, these neonicotinoids bind to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the insect nervous system and have all kinds of effects, for example, on learning and memory, therefore. Um, and so there, there are various, that, that's one of the ways in which bees are adversely affected, unfortunately, by these neonicotinoids. Mm. Does you. that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I'm just curious. I have no idea about flies. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. We have another question from Victor. Victor, are you there? Yes, I hope so. Ah, well, yes, oh. now we hear you. Okay. Yes, I'm in. Okay. Um, well, I have a question about consciousness. Um, Human beings, like all vertebrates, have three types of uh, receptors, uh, exterior receptors, interior receptors, and proprioceptors. And, and the last one, the proprioceptors, inform the mind about the body. And they do so, and the proprioceptors are located in muscles, in tendons, in uh, joints. And when I think that uh, for uh, consciousness, this, these proprioceptors, uh, give our a sense of self of body self of body of our own so i think that self-consciousness by these proprioceptors is essential for building up consciousness and if you think of consciousness in insects i think that they must have a kind of proprioception so my question to you is do insects have proprioception um the answer to that question is very simply yes um, and and you're right that while the demonstration of having proprio receptors is not necessarily evidence of consciousness but it is one requirement um, I don't know to what extent you were told about this in Peter Godfrey Smith's um, lecture a few weeks ago but he makes the very credible point that that, for example, in order to make any kind of sense of the information that is coming from your sensory system um, as a moving animal and to disentangle input changes of input that are the result of your own actions versus those coming from the internal world, you need to make sure which is self-generated 
change or externally um, generated change. So to, to distinguish self from other in terms of the, the sensory input. So for example, if um, I suddenly tilt my head to one side by 45 degrees, then in itself, that's fairly undramatic even though, of course, the entire image on my retina has shifted 45 degrees. If I haven't tilted my head, then the evidence is that I'm in the middle of an earthquake if the entire scenery around me shifts by 45 degrees. Same sensory input on the retina, but either it's from the outside world or the or internally generated. So one needs to, distinct, to disentangle the reasons for what is potentially the same sensory input, either from internally gener generated or externally generated change. And, yeah, and, and uh, Peter Godfrey Smith makes the point that that might be an early origin of consciousness in evolution. Well, yeah, to me it was quite obvious because I think you need to know your own body, at least the size, uh, to escape from pretty predators, for instance. Because if you do not know how large your size, your body is, then it is difficult to escape from a predator. Yeah, that's also true. There's an interesting um, recent study by Shrida Ravi and others published just some weeks ago in PNAS on bumblebees' um, knowledge of their own body size. So he um, and his team let bumblebees fly through gaps of various sizes. And the interesting thing with bumblebee workers is that the workers of the same colony can differ very much in terms of their individual body sizes. And so it turned out that each, each individual bee seemed to be aware of its own constraints um, that are related to its own body dimensions and would thus adopt um, the right kind of flight behavior so that they, if they were too large for the gap, they would angle their bodies slightly sideways or fly completely sideways because their body length is shorter than, than their wingspan. So that was, was an interesting demonstration that each bee was aware of its own personal body dimensions. Thank you. Nice. Very much. I also connect to the next question by uh, Hugo. Hugo, can you turn on your camera and video? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, you can, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, my my question is about uh, maybe the distribution of different skills across the population of the bees. So, do different bees display different levels of skillfulness, let's say, in different tasks? So that you can see, for instance, this group bees perform better for this task and this other subgroup perform better for this other task is, is that something that happens or I, I don't know this is a naive question no it's not a naive question at all so for any kind of um, cognitive trait where we have measured it there are individual differences and there are also sometimes differences between different colonies of the same species. So there is, but there is, there are some colonies which are ex where on average all workers are relatively good at learning a certain task, task, whereas there are other colonies of the same bee species where the, the, the learning is more slow. In terms of the string pulling task that uh, I showed in the, the uh, presentation just now, for example, we tested over 100 workers, and the, the vast majority of them required some sort of training, either by observing conspecifics or by us um, um, making the task gradually more difficult by pushing the, the artificial flower further and further un under the glass screen. There were, however, two individuals that solved the task entirely by themselves without any form of um, gradual training or or um, observation of conspecifics that have already been able to solve the task. Wow, that's really amazing. You, you, you might believe me, I have a chicken skin right now. That's really, really amazing to hear. Thanks a lot right. for your explanation. Okay. All right. It's really impressive. Thanks. Right. Nice. That's nice. Uh, well, that was our last question, Lars. <laughs>
and perfectly on time. So I think uh, I'm, we're going to round up here. Thank you so much for this super interesting lecture and the, the videos. It's very, a very nice way of, uh, and safe way for internet <laughs> reasons <laughs> to do it All like right. this. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining and the questions. Uh, and in well, next week we don't have a, an event in the series, but the week after because of the holidays. And then it's going to be what is it like to be a bacterium with Judith Armitage. So please join for that too. Check our website for more info and also for the ones you missed. And this one, if you want to watch it uh, again, it's also going to be online. So uh, thank you and good night, everybody. <laughs> good night. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>